Welcome back. We are still on the learning module for memory one, and this is the third part. We're going to be talking about the multi-store model of memory. And uh, before we do that, let me just quickly go back to a slide we saw before. All right, here we are, memory metaphors. This was from the first part. Now in this section, when we look at the multi-store model, uh, one way to think about it, it it is a theory suggesting that memory operates uh, very similarly to the way a computer operates. So it's using a computer hardware metaphor uh, for memory processes. Let's jump in. Oh, also this connects uh, a little bit to our previous discussion where we're thinking about memory in terms of an information processing system. When we look at the multi-store model, we will see it uh, as an example of a system of stages of information processing, somewhat like the stages in computer hardware. To begin, let's talk about short versus long-term memory. I'm sure we've all forgotten something that just happened. I'm terrible with phone numbers. If you tell me your phone number, I'll just forget it. Uh, so that's a kind of short-term uh, trying to remember something over the short term. And I'm sure we've also all had the experience of being able to remember something from a long time ago. And this is in contrast to your ability to somewhat rapidly forget what, what just happened. So I can go think back to stuff that happened in my childhood and uh, apparently remember those things. So why can I remember something from so long ago but have such a hard time remembering something that just happened? So this is a big question in memory research. How do we explain the short and long-term aspects of memory ability? And there's different perspectives on answering this question. We'll see some of them in the course. One kind of perspective is actually to propose that there are different kinds of memory systems, one for the short term and one for the long term. We'll see that in the multi-store model. That's not the only way of explaining it. And we will consider some other ideas in memory two, which is the next learning module. Here is the multi-store model. It was proposed in 1968 by Atkinson and Schifrin in a paper called Human Memory, a proposed system and its control processes. They drew a picture of it, of their idea here. And it sort of has a kind of electronic circuit diagram type of picture. The idea is external input from the outside world. So this could be visual information, auditory information and whatnot, comes into a sensory register. And what they have here is a visual, an example of visual information. So you see stuff out there, it goes in your eyes and then it goes somewhere in your brain to a sensory register. This is a buffer that's holding on to that visual information. And what they're saying is uh, this information could be lost. Uh, there's this little arrow that comes out here. So this could be one way you might forget something. Just uh, early visual processing might get accidentally dropped out of the register. If it doesn't get dropped out, then we could follow it into this short-term store. So what they propose is that after early sensory processing, the information that you're processing might go into a short-term memory storage location. And it's possible in this second location, you could lose information out of here. So they have a possibility of forgetting things that are in your short-term storage. And they also have the possibility for that information that's being hold, held onto on a temporary basis to go into long-term storage. So they suggest that there's another third memory system where you can put stuff and it will last much longer because it's more durable, this long-term storage system. Uh, it's also possible to forget things in your long-term storage. So they have a little, little arrow coming out here. Uh, they also suggest it's possible, you know, they, they got this arrow here, 
So this is saying that you could get some information into your sensory register and have it go directly to long-term storage potentially. So there, you know, in this model, it's sort of a computer metaphor where you've got these different locations where you can store information. You've got these arrows connecting hypothetically how information can go from one place to another place and how it can be uh, potentially forgotten as well. So this is their picture. Um, the, we're going to focus in on the short-term storage location. This is another diagram from their paper. And we're going to talk about uh, the rehearsal buffer. This was one of the main ideas in the model. So according to the multi-store model, people can consciously rehearse items in a short-term buffer. And in the model, the more you rehearse an item, the more likely you are to transfer that information to long-term memory. So they've got a picture here of what's going on inside the short-term storage location. And they've got this thing called a rehearsal buffer. It's got different slots in it. These are places you can put things you're trying to remember. And if you rehearse, like go over the list in your head, the more you go over the list, the more likely each item gets transferred to the long-term storage location. This is their main idea. All right, so they proposed this model and they were interested in explaining existing data that was coming out of research into memory processes. We'll see lots of examples of this in memory too when we start looking at individual tasks in more detail. Let me briefly talk about the free recall task. This is a very common memory procedure. You give it to people to measure how well they can remember things. It has two phases. The first phase is usually called the encoding phase. And in this phase, you would read a list of words. So uh, for example, I've got this list of words here. Here's a list. You could go ahead and press pause and give yourself a minute to go through these words and read them all and try to remember them for a later memory test. So I will remove the list. Now let's say you'd spent a minute reading all of those words. You might then go to a recall phase. And here you'd be instructed to write down as many of the words you could remember on a blank sheet of paper. So you might see something like this and you got a pencil and you just got to go write down all those words that you can remember. And then later on, the researcher can look at what you wrote down. They could figure out which words uh, were actually on the list. So you got those ones right. They could figure out which words you didn't report. And they could find any words that uh, you, ex you wrote down that weren't actually on the list. So let's say in the 50s and the 60s, uh, many people were participants in memory experiments where they read lists of words and tried to remember them. And researchers had identified some common uh, findings from these kinds of experiments. One of those common findings is called the serial position curve. We've got the example right here, here's some data. And there's two parts of this. The first part is the primacy effect. This is better memory for the items presented early in the list and there's also the recency effect. That's better memory for the items presented at the end of the list. So if we jumped uh, into this graph here, what we can see is the y-axis is the mean number of items recalled per list. And on the x-axis, we have position in the list. So this little set of dots here has a kind of U shape. And we can see that the word, the first word in the list was uh, remembered quite well, about 75%. The second word was remembered quite well. The third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh word, they're all down here, not remembered as well. But then when we go to the eight, nine, and 10, uh, those ones are re remembered quite well also. 
So the first few words, for example, if you were thinking about the words list I sh showed you earlier, water, tiger, and baseball, you might remember those ones quite well. And that would be a primacy effect because these were the first words you saw. You might also remember penguin painting and couch quite well. That would be the recency effect. Those were the most recent words that you might have been thinking about. And your memory might be a little bit worse for the ones in the middle. Okay, that's the serial position effect. This data here is showing two serial position effects, one for a list with 10 words in it, and one for a list with 32 words in it. You see the same basic pattern happens for a 10 word list and for a 32 word list. Okay, so that is a memory phenomena, the serial position curve. Here's a question. Why does that happen? Why are you better for the early words in a list, not so good for the ones in the middle, and you get better for the ones at the end? How do we explain this serial position curve? This is something that the multi-store model was intended to explain. So let's check it out. How does the model explain the primacy effect? And how does the model explain the recency effect. Um, okay, what I'm going to say is these are two questions you definitely need to understand for the quiz and midterms. Go read the textbook on these topics. I'm going to uh, give my little explanation of these questions by taking a look at this picture again. So the first thing, why does the mo uh, how does this model explain the primacy effect? Well, here's the idea. If you are rehearsing a list of words, so I'll just put our list of words here. So imagine you're in the encoding phase, and this is your list of words you're trying to remember. According to the model, what you're doing is for every word that you read, it goes into your sensory register, and then it goes into one of these slots in the rehearsal buffer. Now, this is a kind of complicated way of saying that people rehearse the words that they're reading. So, for example, uh, let me move this down a little bit so we can see the first word is water. One strategy that people do when they try to remember lists of words is they go like this. Water, tiger, baseball, music, planet, record. Water, tiger, tiger baseball, music, planet, record. Water, tiger, baseball, planet, music. Ah, oh, I got it wrong. So you rehearse the words over and over and over and over in your head. And you might try to add another one. You might try to go water, tiger, baseball, music, planet, record, yellow. Oh, I got one. As you keep adding one to the list, the point is that... Um, you might not be able to rehearse the whole list. You might be limited. Your rehearsal buffer might have a limited capacity for the number of words you can rehearse. Okay, that's one, one limitation here. So imagine what someone's going to be doing is they might be rehearsing, say, these uh, seven or so words, and they'll try to get to the next one. So they might rehearse these seven, and then they'll rehearse these seven. Every time they uh, try to add one, they might not be able to rehearse the earlier ones. But notice that if you were rehearsing all of these things, uh, you would say, for, for example, you might begin with water. You might say, Wa water, tiger, baseball, water, tiger, baseball. You might say that a lot to yourself as you're rehearsing all of those words. Here is how we finally get to the explanation of the primacy effect in the model. The more you rehearse a word, the more likely it will be transferred to the long-term store. That's the, that's the basic idea in the model. So according to this idea, you will uh, have better long-term memory for any word that you rehearsed the most. So if water was the first word, 
you might have rehearsed that one the most because you kept saying water, tiger, baseball, water, tiger, baseball. You kept saying water every single time in your head. And maybe that's why, according, well, sorry, that is why, according to the model, you would have better memory uh, for that first word. So this first word would be the one you rehearsed a lot. Okay. So how does the model explain the recency effect? Let's go back, think about this model. Remember, that's the finding that people have really good memory for the words at the end of the list. Now, the words at the end of the list probably weren't rehearsed a whole bunch of times. By the time you get to the end of the list, you might not have enough time to, to rehearse them many times. So, these words are probably not transferred to the long-term memory store because you didn't rehearse them a lot of times. How could it be that you have such good memory for them if they're not in the long-term memory storage? Okay, well again we can think about an explanation in terms of this rehearsal buffer and Put yourself in the shoes of a participant who's trying to remember all these words. When you get to the very end of the encoding phase, so let's say you have like two whole minutes to try to remember all these words. By the end, you're getting close to the end of that two minutes, you might be down here and you might be thinking, ooh, chair, penguin, painting couch, chair, penguin, painting couch, right? Just get those last ones, try, 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 try to rehearse them. And uh, you maybe didn't get to go through them very many times, um, but maybe you did rehearse them a few times, so maybe a, some of them are in long-term memory, that's one thing. At the same time, when the memory test begins, what are the words that you're repeating to yourself in your head? You might be going, oh, chair, penguin, painting, couch. Write down all the words, you know, okay, great, chair, penguin, painting, couch. Because those are the ones that are in your head that are you're currently rehearsing, you might write those ones down first just to get them out of your rehearsal buffer. And that is one of the explanations about why people have better memory for the words at the end of the list. All right, you got better memory for those words because those are the ones you're repeating in your head when the memory test begins. Okay. What's fun about all of this is we can consider these explanations and attempt to test them to see if they hold up under uh, different kind of experimental pressures. So for example, we can test the ideas behind the rehearsal account. This is something that you could consider. It's like if you thought that rehearsing words in your head was the reason why you're better at remembering the final words of a list, is there some way you could subject that idea to further scrutiny, perhaps with an experiment? Um, for example, what, hap what would happen if you maybe gave people some other thing to do, like count backwards from 137 in steps of 19. Can, you, can I even do that? 137 minus 19, uh, it's 127 minus seven plus two is 120 something. I'm trying, but as soon as I start doing that, what's going on in my head is I'm thinking about math problems. So, instead of having the four words I was just repeating in my head, in my rehearsal buffer, now I'm thinking about 130 something minus something something else, and those words in my short-term memory system might have just gone away. So maybe if we interrupted people and gave them some other task that uh, washes out all the things in their short-term memory buffer, maybe they 
wouldn't have good memory for the last items in a list because those items would no longer be in their rehearsal buffer. And this is the kind of thing that people started to do. So for example, you in 1965, Postman and Phillips, they manipulated whether or not participants did arithmetic problems before they did a recall test for the words. And as we just talked about, arithmetic problem solving should make rehearsal difficult, right? It's hard to re rehearse some words while you're doing math problems. Let's check out what happened. Okay, zero seconds. This is what happens when you give people a list of words to remember, and after um, the encoding period is over, they immediately get a memory test. There's zero seconds of delay between encoding and writing down all the words. They had lists of different lengths, and everyone had better memory for the first words on the list, and they had really good memory for the last words on the list. And it didn't matter how long the list was. Down here, we have 30 seconds of delay. Now what happened was after you were learning the words in the list, for 30 seconds, you had to do math problems. And after the math problems, then you had to remember the words that you read before. Look what happened here. Everyone is still good on those first words, but there is no advantage for the most recent words. The recency effect is gone. It's been wiped out entirely. And this provides uh, evidence in favor of this idea that by wiping out the rehearsal buffer, we can eliminate the recency effect in the serial position curve. Now, one thing that's fun about cognitive psychology is things are really never as simple as they seem. For example, let's consider this experiment from Zeng in 1973. And this was another standard free recall experiment, but it had a twist. And let's check out the twist. So his subjects were given four lists of 10 words. Here's the twist. After you heard each word, um, so instead of seeing a list of words like this, uh, you would, I think, hear each word be read aloud. Okay. So it would be more like, get ready, you're going to hear some words. I'm going to read the word to you, water. Now, after each word, participants spent 20 seconds counting backwards by threes from a random starting digit. Oh, that sounds horrible. So it'd be like this. Remember the word water, but now start at 57 and count backwards by three. So 57, uh, 54, 51, 48 blah, 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 blah. Do that for 20 seconds. And then tiger. And so remember that word, but start counting back by three from 109. So you go 109, 106, uh, you know. So we do that for every single word. And that should just wipe out anything that is ever in your rehearsal buffer, because what you're doing is thinking about numbers and uh, you're rehearsing numbers and you're not rehearsing the, the words in the list. So, hopefully you would agree that counting backwards by threes is a very demanding task, and this should occupy and replace the contents of any short-term rehearsal buffer. Okay, so here's the Postman and Phillips data and we would expect to find something like this here, I think. No recency effects. You should not be better for the words at the end of a list uh, because you wouldn't really have any words in your rehearsal buffer to just read off at 
the end. So we would expect the data to be like this one down here and not up here where we see the recency effects. However, that's not what was found. Instead, this is the data from that experiment. Here we clearly see both a primacy effect and a recency effect. And this is interesting. It's a sort of outlying data point that can't be explained very easily by the multi-store model. So I've brought this up as an example here where we've seen uh, a kind of idea about how long-term and short-term memory processes might work in the form of the multi-store model. We've seen some predictions that it makes, and we've seen how it explains some phenomena like the serial position curve in memory recall experiments. But we've also seen some data points that can't be explained very well by that model. And we're not going to persist in this line here, uh, but, but this is a very common situation in cognitive psychology where we have an, a, a model-based idea about how something works, and we've got some data that support the model, and we've got some data that are it's kind of confusing to understand from the perspective of the model. And if we were to follow this line of research since the 1960s, we would see uh, various proposals being put forward to, to try to modify the original model to account for these kinds of outlying data points. A, a final kind of thing I want to talk about momentarily is this distinction between systems and strategies. In cognition, uh, different researchers uh, take what I would say is different research approaches uh, to explanation. And sometimes their models are put forward using system-like uh, explanation. So for example, the multi-store model, if we look at it, it, uh, it looks like they're proposing a system of these hardware locations where information gets stored and transferred between these different stages in the system. At the same time, uh, this is kind of using system language or system metaphors to dress up a, an idea that maybe doesn't require all of these components of a system to be articulated properly. So another kind of idea here is to talk about strategies. This has been something I've been talking about the entire time in this class. Um, when you give people a list of words to remember, they often adopt a strategy of repeating the words over and over in their head. And that is called a rehearsal strategy. And it, it's quite possible that performance in memory recall tasks depends on the strategies that people use in those tasks. And if you're a kind of person who's going to try to rehearse words in your head, that will lead you to perform certain ways in these tasks. If you adopt a different kind of strategy, that would lead you to perform in a different way. And uh, the strategies that you use, or performance might, sorry, let me say, performance in the memory test might uh, reflect the strategies that you use more than any uh, systems where you so place so-called information. And uh, yeah, I think the textbook does a better job of getting into this, but even though it's clear that people have different abilities over the short and long term to remember information, there is actually continuous debate in the field of cognitive psychology about whether we need to uh, whether we need separate short and long term memory systems in order to explain this behavior. So here's what's next. Go for uh, the quiz for this learning module and take any assignments by the due date. And we'll see you next week for our second learning module on memory. We're gonna talk a lot more about different tasks and findings that we uh, have collected over 100 years of memory research. Okay, that's it for me. See you.